Today I'm talking about the Milky Way season, when you can see the Milky Way, how you can see the Milky Way, and what tools you might need to help you find it in the night sky, as well as a bit about planning to go out and photograph it. The Milky Way is actually visible all year round in the night sky, but different parts of it are visible at different times of the year. When people talk about the Milky Way season, they're actually talking about the galactic centre of our Milky Way being in the sky at night. Now this is the wider and brighter part of the Milky Way. And if you were looking at our galaxy from a distance, it would be the centre of the wheel-like structure that makes up our galaxy. Because we live within our galaxy, it's almost as if we're looking at it from the side and within. So the galactic core is that bulge in the middle and the tendrils or arms stretch around the Earth on a narrow plane. So we can normally either see the fainter arm sections or the slightly brighter core in the sky, depending on the light pollution levels and the cloud cover. When you first go out at night and really notice what's above you in the sky, it's common to mistake the Milky Way for a light strip of cloud streaking across the sky. But if you let your eyes adjust, and especially if you're in a really dark location, you can start to make out more detail in the Milky Way. And if the galactic core is in the sky, you can even start to see the darker and brighter clouds within and around the core. So first of all, you need to be out at the right time of year to see that core of the Milky Way. It's in the sky from February to October, but this can start later or finish sooner depending on where you are on our planet. Obviously, because the Earth is spherical, different parts of the planet will see different parts of the night sky, and this includes the Milky Way. In the Northern Hemisphere, from February to June, the Milky Way rises late in the evening, towards midnight, and it's visible in the early morning until the sun starts to brighten the sky and make the stars and Milky Way invisible. So this is the time of long sleepless nights for astrophotographers. At this time of the year, the Milky Way is flatter in the sky as well. And by this, I mean more parallel to the horizon. So this is a good time to get panorama photographs of the Milky Way with the core visible. You also have to look in a southeasterly direction to see it. Now this direction is important if you're thinking of a specific location to shoot. If you know where it will rise in the sky, you know where you need to be to get that part of the land in the shot that you want. From July to August, it starts to rise earlier in the night in the southern skies, and it's at its best in the middle of the night. By the end of the night, before the sun starts to bleach out those stars, it will be in a more vertical position in the sky. So if you want to get a panorama at this time of the year, it's best to go out as early as possible in the night to have it in that more horizontal position. Whereas if you have a specific subject you want to photograph with the Milky Way towering over it, later in the night is better. In the months of September and October, you can see it in the evening and it will be more vertical in the sky when it becomes visible, after that sun has set and after that astronomical twilight. Now this isn't a really good time to get a panorama of the Milky Way. Well, when I say panorama, I mean one of those classic ones where it arcs over a single subject. You need to get those earlier in the year. However, again, it's great if you want to get the Milky Way towering vertically over your landscape. So at this time of the year, it will be vertical and it will be in the southwesterly skies. Also, in the Northern Hemisphere, the further north you go, the less likely it is that you will see the galactic core of the Milky Way. And also the less time you'll have when it is actually above the horizon. As it is visible from March to September, the months when it's at its best will also be the months where there's the least amount of true nighttime. And also, the further north you go, the shorter those nights will become. This really is narrowing the amount of time you've got to photograph that Milky Way. So if you live in Alaska, northern Scandinavia or northern Russia, you'll really struggle to see the core, let alone photograph it. And there are a lot of challenges to see it even in Northern Europe, Canada and Russia. Basically, the closer you are to the equator, the better it gets, with longer nights and the galactic core being much higher in the sky. Although in saying that, then with those hotter climates closer to the equator come other problems like haziness in the air and tropical storms. So lower visibility to even see the stars in the first place. So there's also a bit of luck involved when you do go out and try to photograph the Milky Way. 
In the southern hemisphere, it tends to rise in a more vertical position to the east earlier in the year, and then it sets in a more horizontal position in the sky to the west. In the middle of the night, it will be directly overhead. If you want a shot of just the core, this is great. If you have a tracker and want to get a close-up, this is also good as you're looking through the least amount of atmosphere compared to when the core is really close to the horizon. But when it is high in the sky, it's a lot harder to get any parts of the ground in your shot if that's the look you're going for. As the season moves on, the Milky Way core starts to become visible higher in the sky and slightly to the north earlier in the evening and then sets in a horizontal position to the west. It keeps on getting earlier in the night when it is visible until in October it only shows itself for a short period of time as soon as it gets dark. And this is towards the west and northwest. So just from having this information alone, you could probably start to think of some compositional ideas that might work after knowing how it sits in the sky. If you've got something on the horizon that you want the Milky Way to arc over, anything like this can work when that Milky Way is lower in the sky and more horizontal. Whereas if you've got an object where you might want it to tower over, that's when you need to plan around when that Milky Way will be vertical in the sky. Also, you might not want the core in the shot at all. Sometimes the fainter parts of the Milky Way work really well in a composition. If you're planning a trip, it's worth doing a bit of research like I'm doing now to see how the Milky Way will be in the sky where you're going to be at that location. Some locations work better when it's horizontal in the sky and others work better when it's vertical in the sky. Now there is a bit more to photographing the Milky Way than just finding out where it is in the sky and you need to plan around the moon. As with a full moon, it will be so bright that it will start to bleach out the stars in the Milky Way. So they'll be less visible when that moon is out. The best time to go is around a new moon when the night skies are really dark. The Milky Way is really faint. So the less light there is to compete with that faint distant light, the better. Now I go out as near to the new moon as possible, or at most five days either side of the new moon. This gives me enough time under the Milky Way to get some good photographs of it. Now I've already talked about the limitations of the northern parts of the northern hemisphere, with there being limited amounts of total darkness during the summer months, and the core being really close to the horizon. And if the moon gets in the way, this will limit your time even more. So if you are in the Northern Hemisphere and you are quite far north, it's best to try and get out on the day of the new moon or at most one to two days either side of it. Then you'll get as much time as you can to get a decent photograph of the Milky Way. The best way to plan around this is to either get an app like PhotoPills or Planet Pro, or if you don't want to pay for an app, just Google it. Google will give you an answer straight away so you can plan ahead to the next new moon. If you want to take some good astrophotography photographs, you need to become accustomed to the weather and any seasonal variations in your area. If you are planning a trip to a specific location, what the weather patterns might be doing in that location are really good to know about. And then all you need to do is keep an eye on that location and its weather. With a bit of research, you can find out a lot. And again, with Google or whichever search engine you use, you can just search for those patterns. Just start to pay attention to the weather and see if you can spot any trends. Or if it looks like you're gonna get some settled weather coming in, see where the moon is in its cycle. And if it's a new moon, plan a quick shoot and head out. When I used to live in the UK, I had to do this to get anything decent. I'd have my camera bag packed up and ready to go, especially around a new moon. And if the weather cleared, I could go out for a night by just picking my bag up and heading to a pre-planned location. For places with very temperamental weather, this is the only way you're gonna be able to get out under the stars, by planning a few different locations, being ready, and then waiting for a break in the weather. With the light pollution, I have gone over this in a few different tutorials here on my channel, but finding a good dark location near you or where you intend on traveling to is so important. The darker the location, the better, as those night skies are so faint. I did a test the other day and the skies here in the city that I live in at the moment are 10 stops brighter than most of the dark sky locations I've been to. So that shows how dark they really are. The best resource for working out the light pollution in your area is lightpollutionmaps.info. 
I check locations on this all of the time, and if the Bortle rating is four or lower, I know it has potential. Also, you need to look in the direction you are intending on taking the photograph. If there's light pollution in that direction, this can ruin a shot. So this is why it's good to know where the Milky Way will be in the sky, at what time, and what potential light problems there might be in that direction. To find a location, I first of all look on the light pollution map for some dark areas near me. Then I look at how the Milky Way behaves in that position. I can work out where it'll be in the sky and therefore how good a location might be. If there's no source of light pollution in the direction that I'm going to be shooting in and it's a relatively dark place, again, I know it has potential. I'll then go and scout the location beforehand with my phone and photo pills in hand and then check out different places and different locations to see what might work in the day. Photo pills does have an AR function where you can kind of hold your phone up and use the camera on your phone and then it will project where the Milky Way is going to be. So you can almost frame up your shot before you've ever been to that location at night. Again, you can work out to see if there might be any problems before you even get there at night. The worst thing you want to do is go to a location and there being a locked gate or some other hazards that you might not have thought of. So you can see there's a lot of planning that goes into astrophotography and photographing the Milky Way. After shooting this tutorial, I decided that I'm gonna make a series on this as it's so important. It is one thing to know how to set your camera up, and that is important, but if you don't know how to choose a location and you don't know what time to go there, you still won't get a good shot. Now the next video will be on specific locations around the world just to see how the Milky Way looks at those locations and how it changes from location to location. So when it's ready I'll link it here and if you want to learn how to photograph the stars while you're waiting for that video to come out click down here and if you haven't already be sure to subscribe for two weekly tutorials in photography. I'll see you next time.